You've created a magnificent board game. The concept is new, the mechanisms are beautifully interwoven, it's well balanced, it's rigorously playtested, and the theme and mechanisms complement each other perfectly. This should obviously be the next big thing. But there's one problem. People just don't seem to get it. When you teach the game to playtesters, it takes far longer than it should. They ask irrelevant questions, they make assumptions about how to play, they ignore the rules or they add in rules that you didn't teach them. After one or two rounds of play, they start telling you the ways that you could change your game. You're frustrated. You tell them to just play a few rounds and they'll enjoy it, you promise. And you're right, of course, everyone enjoys your game once they get into the flow of it. Your regular playtesters love it. The trouble is, you're having the same issue with publishers. They look quizzically at you as you explain the concept. They ask irrelevant questions during your pitch. They're already making suggestions of how to change your game and they haven't even played it. Once again, you're frustrated. Your defenses are up. You ask them just to try it and surely they'll see that the game is exceptionally fun once everybody gets into the flow. And you're right, of course you're right. You know your product. The email arrives a couple of months later, an offer of publication. You're ecstatic, your moment has arrived. Email communication with your publisher isn't good. They don't update you often, and when they do, it's usually with an obvious rules query or a suggestion to alter the rules of the game, but they've overlooked the purpose of the mechanism that they want to change. They haven't understood the implications of the change. They just don't understand the product like you do. You reluctantly agree to a few minor rules changes, and you have little control over the aesthetic decisions being made by the publisher. But there are many core concepts which you won't shift on. You can't. It just wouldn't be the same game. Months later, a parcel arrives on your doorstep. Twelve complimentary copies of your game. You're overwhelmed with pride. Your name is right there above the game title. This is your baby. You made this. The package is beautifully produced. The choice of artwork isn't to your taste, but it's undeniably well drawn and the rules are faithful to your original concept. You have landed. This game is going to be hot. The game is released a few weeks later at a massive international convention, along with hundreds of other new titles. On day one of the convention, you're excited to see a copy on a demo table at the publisher's stand. Oh, it looks great. There are posters and everything. But throughout the day, you're starting to feel a little anxious. Nobody seems to be playing your game. The demo team are focusing on another game from the same publisher. The table next to yours is packed with customers wanting to play, while your game is overlooked. You blame the publisher, the demo team. They're not pushing your game forward. They're doing it wrong. On day two, your demo table has become the place where the demo team pile up their stuff. Flyers, coats, snacks. It's a side table now. Nobody's playing. You decide to take control, offering yourself up to spend the day demonstrating your game. If you could just get people playing, you know that they'll love it. The demo team is extremely happy with this arrangement. If you're demoing your own game, they can focus all their attention on the hot title next door. Demoing your game is really fun. Players have lots of questions about the rules and it can take a little while to get up and running, but it's nothing that you haven't faced many, many times during playtesting. And they always enjoy it once they get into it. Many of them go on to purchase a copy when your demonstration is finished. By the end of the day, you've made a handful of sales and you feel okay with that. It's a start. Happy customers talk to their friends, right? Gamers speak online. Word is going to spread. But it increasingly dawns on you that no one is talking about your game. No players, no reviewers, not even the publisher. And if no one is talking about it, then no one is buying. Surely it shouldn't be this hard. I'm Adam Porter. I'm a game designer and reviewer from Wales. I have a number of published games from various international publishers and I like to share my experiences here on YouTube. Currently, 67% of my viewers are not subscribed to this channel. So if you enjoy what I do, it would really help me a lot if you clicked subscribe and shared the video with other gamers and designers. Returning to my tale of woe, a fun product flopping at retail, can you 
identify the problem. Is it the publisher? Fickle and uncommitted, willing to flit from product to product until they find the one which connects. The money spinner, abandoning trickier prospects, harder sells and condemning them to obscurity. Or is it the marketing? Would the problem be solved by more posters, more adverts, more conventions, pushing review copies out to every YouTube channel, every blogger? Or is it the designer, arrogant, unmovable, too close to their product, unable to see it the way their customers do? Perhaps it's the product itself. The playtesters are telling you it's hard to understand, unintuitive, they're making assumptions. The game just doesn't feel right. And of course, all of these factors could be impacting. It's frustrating because we have a great little game here. Playtesters love it when they give it a chance. We've got a willing publisher. They wouldn't put their money behind the product if they didn't want it to succeed. They see the fun in the game. And we have a passionate, driven, skilled designer capable of creating a game which players enjoy and publishers are willing to get behind. Now I'm going to urge you to look at your design through new eyes. Try to see your game as your potential purchasers see it. A potential purchaser comes to your product with preconceived ideas, biases, and their own frames of reference. When they first encounter your product, they look for clues, however tiny, to place the game into a predefined box, to pigeonhole the product based on past experience. On first impressions alone, they instinctively think they know what your game is and who it's for. They create their own shadow version of the product in their head. They set expectations for the product, and if it fails to reach these expectations, they reject it. Every first encounter is filled with tiny decisions about what's worth paying attention to and what can be safely ignored. This poses a problem for game designers who are attempting to rise above the crowd in a saturated market. If you innovate, you risk confusing potential purchasers. But if you stick with familiar concepts, how are you ever going to stand out? An effective product designer controls the context in which their product is seen. A brilliant game in the wrong context is always going to fail. Your seven-year-old attends a birthday party, and he's super excited that he got to play loads and loads of games. His own birthday's coming up, so you decide to plan a special surprise for his own party. You book Rainer Knizia, the world's greatest board game designer, to attend and teach the kids some of his best games. The day of the party arrives, and you're really excited to see the kids enjoy themselves. But Knizia is a flop. The kids won't sit down and listen to the rules explanation. Some wander off and kick balloons around the living room. One of the more sensitive children pulls you to one side and politely asks, could they play musical chairs? A less polite child asks you bluntly, who's the creepy guy with the bow tie? The majority of the public, they don't know nearly as much as we do about the craft of game production. We are experts. We know what has worked well before and what's been done to death. We know the pitfalls of specific mechanisms and genres. And we have strong opinions about outdated design. The majority of customers have none of this knowledge. The intricacies of your design are just that. They're intricacies. For a casual player who picks up a game once or twice a year, an outdated design is perfectly serviceable for their needs. They have fun with it, they don't think too much about the negative aspects, or simply they don't have the vocabulary to articulate which aspects of gameplay were unenjoyable and why. They don't know what a cutting-edge board game looks like. A good friend of mine picked up a copy of Splotter Spellen's Indonesia, a complex economic masterpiece long out of print from a charity shop. He paid £2. Now that game generally sells for £150 to £200. And I don't doubt that the game had sat in that charity shop for months, ignored by the casual shoppers as they browsed the various battered boxes of Seenit and Cranium, overlooked by customers with no frame of reference to place such a product in their mind. It's essential to position your game effectively in the marketplace. Your product brings something new, right? You've presumably built your game around a strong hook. And if you're not sure what that means, click on the link. But don't forget to come back to this video later. With the hook established, you now need to pinpoint a specific market, identify your competitors and highlight the various aspects of your product that surpass the leading titles. 
It's also worth considering whether that market is penetrable at all, or does one title have the market sewn up? I was sad to see recent announcements of the closure of Holy Grail Games. Their game, Caesar's Empire, was one of my highlights of 2022. How would you position a game like that? Well, the game was originally a Polish title, which translated as Road to Rome, with a generic Roman setting and some cute, cartoony artwork. The game involves connecting a network of tokens between different cities. Longer routes attract greater rewards, and the board gradually amassed chains of different coloured tokens. The game is extremely accessible, with minimal rules, a short playing time, but some really tense, impactful decisions. It truly is an exceptional design. But there's an elephant in this room. Not so much an elephant as a great hulking woolly mammoth. Ticket to Ride involves connecting cities with tokens. Ticket to Ride is extremely accessible, with minimal rules and impactful decisions. And Ticket to Ride has an 18-year head start on Road to Rome. Not every corner of the market is as clearly monopolised as this one. If you wanted to create a new worker placement game, yes, Agricola looms large, but so does Viticulture, and Architects of the West Kingdom, and Everdell, and so many others. There isn't a crowned king of worker placement games, at least not yet. Why is no one producing map-building games with square tiles, except for one designer, Klaus-Jürgen Rader, and his collaborators at Hans im Gluck? We have countless polyomino games releasing year on year. Carcassonne has dominated this mechanical niche since the turn of the century, and it doesn't let up. Expansions and new additions flood out year after year to keep the game at the top. Cacao was a fab little 2015 game from Phil Walker Harding. It used a similar approach to Carcassonne, a map built out of monominoes inhabited with wooden tokens. It didn't stay the course. Isle of Sky is a great little title from Alexander Pfister, and this one did gain some traction, but primarily by position itself as a midweight euro with an economic system at its core. It didn't play Carcassonne at its own game. It didn't encroach on the gateway territory. Isle of Sky wasn't pitched at Spiel des Jahres level. It was a Kennerspiel, a game for connoisseurs. It's important to understand what products your game is going to be compared to. And not just by critics, though they certainly have influence, but by customers. Game purchasers only have so much disposable income, and there are only so many shelves in a Kallax. Customers will inevitably make judgments on your game's value by comparing it to its competitors. So rather than take on the might of Ticket to Ride, Road to Rome pivoted. It was repositioned as an Asterix game. And Asterix is of course a hugely popular French comic book, a bond désignée with total sales of 385 million units, the second highest selling book series of all time after Harry Potter. It makes sense. As a network-building, light introductory game, Road to Rome had no chance. It really didn't. The gameplay was excellent. I'm sure it sold a few thousand copies on that basis alone, but it was never going to achieve widespread success. Holy Grail Games repositioned the game outside of the hobby, pitching it as Asterix merchandise. And we could argue about their success in doing so. The game is lavishly produced, potentially pushing it out of the 7-14 to 14 year old Asterix age range. And the focus on Asterix's enemy, Julius Caesar, rather than the more recognisable Gaulish villagers, may have been an error. But the central strategy is sound. Recognise when you're fighting a losing battle, regroup and find your niche. The great thing about board games is that they're a creative medium, they're malleable. The game maker gets to set the context, the lens through which their game is viewed. Movie makers are particularly effective at context setting. They establish everything a potential viewer needs to know in a 30 second trailer. The location, the tone, the characters, the relationships. Your product needs to do the same with its outward presentation. Don't let the customer create their own shadow product in their head. You tell them what the product is, who it's for, and why they should care. Now, I've previously picked apart the failings in my worst-selling game, Throne. If we accept that it's a decent concept, and yes, I know, that's a big if, there are plenty of detractors, but let's assume that it's a fun little dice game. The mistake was all about context. I designed a chaotic, silly, in-your-face dice chucker. And then I sold it as an ingenious twist on traditional trick-taking mechanisms. 
Worse still, I placed it in a generic fantasy setting with D&D trappings. I made two clear promises to two distinct audiences and I failed to deliver on either. I should have slapped some wacky artwork on it and not taken myself so damn seriously. In the right context, that game delivers. Click on the link to hear more of my thoughts on why this title flopped. I can identify failings in most of my other games. Picoco is a really fun, quirky card game. The aesthetics lift it enormously, but the required card holders necessitate a large box, which sets expectations of a meatier experience. And crucially, they increase the retail price above what the game can bear. If you've ever watched a home improvement show on TV, you'll have heard the frequent advice never to exceed the ceiling price for your local area. Big Bazaar was my first game. I intended it as a party game for families and adults. Blue Orange felt that it would be better suited to younger kids, so they simplified the rules and they created wonderful childish illustrations. The game fell between two stools. It was still too complex for youngsters, but it was too cute for adults. Doodle Rush sold really well in comparison to my other games, but we discovered upon release that it appealed strongly to young children. It's a drawing game which only lasts six minutes, so it's perfect for short attention spans and creative competitive kids. But in order to play the game, you have to be able to read. And some of the words are pretty tough. I'm sure we could have capitalised on that audience if we'd spotted its kid appeal earlier. Of course, we can't disguise a bad product by dressing it up with fancy marketing and manipulating people into purchasing. Clever positioning is not going to solve mechanical issues or frustrating gameplay or shoddy presentation. But what it can do is make your life easier. It allows you to ride the waves of fads and trends in a constantly shifting marketplace. Now this doesn't necessarily mean trends within the board game industry. Every year there seems to be a dominant animal in the plush toy sphere. A visit to London Toy Fair will be awash with unicorns one year, sloths the next. Llamas were a trend for a prolonged period. Trends can be determined by what's popular in film, TV and books. Or they could relate to technology, app integration, augmented reality, artificial intelligence. I hope to talk about designing to trends in a future video. Wingspan's massive success started when the game got attention from bird watchers and naturalists. Prolific UK publisher Alley Cat Games made its start by courting scientists and journals with its debut title Lab Wars. Consider products which might have been positioned outside of the board game market but found a natural home on game store shelves. Micro Macro is really a new take on the Where's Wally concept, but rather than compete with a superstar product in the picture book market, Illustrator Johann Sick carved out a niche in the board game realm, where it really has no competition. A brilliant move, Micro Macro went on to win the prestigious Spiel des Jahres Award in 2021. The overarching message here is, if you want to create board games, you need to understand the market. Keep up with new releases, follow the trends and patterns, get to know the different avenues available to you. Would your game fit best in the mass market or in the hobby sphere? What theme or setting would help your game to stand out among its peers? Is there a dominant game in your niche which is going to make your journey harder? Would a popular license help to lift the product? What games are you going to be compared to? And which aspects of your game surpass theirs? How could you highlight those features? And perhaps most importantly of all, is this a competition that you can win. For more product design discussion, follow the link.